Hello everyone. The following is the fourth and final in a series of lectures covering chapter 40. Today we'll be going over sections 40.7, the double slit experiment, and 40.8, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Keep in mind that section 40.7, which we'll talk about first, is supplemental. We've seen in the optics chapters uh, discussion on the double slit experiment first done by Thomas Young. You sent a sort of monochromatic, so just light from the same source, from the same color. You shot that into a, a small barrier with just two slits. And on the other side, you put on a projection screen. And what you'd see is this pattern of alternating bright fringes. So based on that and the understanding that you know waves do this, ripples of water um, will interfere with one another, light was displaying this interference pattern after passing by two, two slits. So at the time, this gave conclusive proof of light being a wave. We now understand that uh, light can also act like a particle. So in regards to the double slit experiment, it's just an instance of light acting like a wave, creating interference on the screen. But we know that in other situations, like common scattering, it acts like a particle. We're going to see that electrons are the same. Now imagine a similar setup, but rather than setting a laser and shooting it into this barrier with two slits, we're now going to have a source of electrons, an electron beam. And the idea is that the electrons are all set up so that they have the same energy. We call them monoenergetic. And you aim the beam towards a barrier with two slits. And on the other side, some distance away, there's this uh, detector screen. And obviously, you know, electrons um, are not light. You can't see them. But what you can do with the screen on the other side is that um, you can have these like, you know, little uh, pixels, little um, current detectors, so that wherever electrons strike, that will get marked on the screen. And so as you keep shooting electrons from your electron beam into the double slit, eventually you should see a pattern forming on the screen. And the question is, well, what are the electrons going to look? Um, what's, a, what's a pattern on the screen going to look like? And at least when you know the sort of experiments were being done, the idea was that you know electrons as were well understood to be particles, just like protons, just like neutrons, just like anything else. And thus, if you're just shooting particles into um, this double slit screen, what you'd get on the other side is just two columns, just you know, uh, sl two slit shaped um, regions on the screen that are illuminated. Because if they're particles, then the electrons would just kind of you know funnel into one of the two slits and hit the hit the screen right in front of it. Now, what people saw though was that um, once you left the electron beam uh, aimed at the two slit barrier long enough, the pattern on the screen was not just two. Um, two bright fringes, you know, one for each slit, but rather what seemed like an interference pattern. And you can kind of see the pictures here how as you keep shooting electrons, um, multiple fringes begin to appear. So there was minima, there was maxima, and this will not be explained by a particle model because electrons were, you know, particles, and you can mention it like shooting paintballs through the slits. You just have them go straight. You know, you can have this thing. This will imply that electrons, you know, are reaching places that are not right in front. So this shows then that electrons were interfering. 
the same way that light does, it interferes with itself when being shot through a double slit. And the only difference though is that when electrons do reach the screen, right, a single electron leaps a single, sort of hits a single point on the screen. Um, so it's as if electrons do produce this interference pattern, but each, each individual electron effectively only leaps one spot, only makes one mark on the screen. And overall, the chances of, you know, where electrons were gonna fall on the screen, um, you could represent that with the same function. You could represent the intensity of a diffraction or interference pattern. What that means is that whatever, you know, points in the interference pattern of light where light have a bright fringe, like say at this point here, this is the highest intensity point, this is the central maxima. Um, electrons are more likely to, to be found here than in the points that correspond to the uh, dark fringes of light to the minima. So the, the pattern was the same as for light. And thus, once you had your um, screen here uh, lit up after a lot of electrons had landed on it, you could measure you know, where the uh, electron fringes there are and figure out that the <clears throat> that there is then a relationship between the locations of the uh, bright and dark fringes and the path length difference between um, electrons coming from either slit. So remember that light creates fringes because throughout the screen, throughout the detector screen, the path length between the two slits changes. So that creates constructive and destructive interference. So it seemed that for the pattern created with electrons, um, it followed the, the same the same rules for constructive and destructive interference as light in double slit diffraction. What that meant was that you could then use the same formulas and get a wavelength. And if you could get a wavelength, then that means that you were effectively finding the wavelength of electrons. Interestingly enough, if you shoot um, the electron beam at a very slow rate, so that you're guaranteed that only one electron is entering the slit barrier uh, at any time, you will still generate the um, interference pattern eventually. So you could think, okay, well, you know, you're shooting all these electrons, um, you know, at a, high, at a fast rate into the two slits. So you, of course, are probably bumping into each other, bouncing all over the place. So hence why you get a spread out pattern like that. But no, even when there's just one electron going in at a time, the pattern eventually forms. So that means that the electron is interfering with itself. That means that the electron is not just going through one slit, it's going through both slits and interfering. This may seem odd, but the only reason it seems odd is because we made a wrong assumption, a fundamental misconception of electrons that makes this seem odd. We assumed this whole time that electrons were particles, that shooting them into the slits was like shooting marbles. If we let go of that notion and begin to rethink how we see electrons, the fact that an electron can go through both slits makes sense. Rather than thinking about electrons the way we always thought about them, about these little balls orbiting a nucleus, let's think about what a wrapper, what a wrapper, sorry, what a water ripple would do when encountering the double slit barrier. If you were to shoot a water ripple into the barrier here, it will pass through both slits. The same thing light does. When you shoot a monochromatic laser, it passes through both slits and creates an interference pattern. So let's say that we had forgotten everything about electrons that we learned in school so far. And we said, you see this water ripple? You see how it like diffracts and interferes after it passes through the two openings? If we said there's a thing called an electron, that that's the same thing, we'd have an easier time taking that at face value. 
But we have already built up this conception of electrons as being these particles or being the nucleus, which is true. But it is also true that when it comes to uh, an electron beam shooting electrons into two slits, this is, is how an electron behaves. It behaves like a wave, like a water ripple. And as does, it goes through both slits and creates interference. The only difference, though, unlike light, is that you know you won't see a pattern projected. Once the electron does go on the other side, um, it only ends up in one spot. So when it comes to crossing the two slits, though, an electron acts like any wave, like the water ripple, and actually goes through both slits. And this slide is kind of restating what I was saying earlier about um, the whole notion of electrons as waves being unfamiliar. But the notion of, again, electrons being floaty little particles is true, but it is not the full picture. That is an approximation that we use during chemistry, during electricity and magnetism, because it works well enough for describing behaviors such as ionization and the electrostatic force. And that explains all of that. It just doesn't explain everything um, about the nature of matter. So when it comes to this diffraction pattern, it no longer works. You need to now think of electrons as also having wave particles, wave properties, I mean. And that's how the quantum cookie crumbles. Well, now we're on to the uh, last uh, section for the chapter, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So anytime you want to, um, you know, and you want to see how tall uh, you are, or, uh, you want to see um, how long um, to go for a run for, or, you know, how much uh, to weigh the flour you need for a recipe, you're using some kind of instrument, some kind of ruler, some kind of scale, some kind of stopwatch. And every instrument you use has some, some resolution, some minimum number that you can measure. If you have a meter stick, the probably, probably the smallest unit of measurement is a centimeter. Um, with a regular scale, it might be like a tenth of a kilogram. And a stopwatch probably only tells you a hundredth of a second. So every instrument for, to obtain physical measurements has some uncertainty to it. Um, and if you want to take you know, a better measurement, maybe you're trying to, to measure the um, thickness of perhaps a, um, a piece of paper. Obviously, a meter stick won't really work because the only thing you can measure, the smallest thing you can measure is a centimeter, a piece of paper thinner than that. So maybe you grab a, you know, like a caliper and thus you can measure thinner things and you can then get a measurement in the little thickness of the piece of paper. So normally, if we don't have enough, you know, accuracy or resolution for tools, we can usually find a better tool to measure better. And that means, though, that you can always take more accurate measurements of different properties. You can always get a better watch, a better scale, or a better ruler. So there's really no limit to how well we can improve the accuracy of our measurements. Pause for effect. Quantum mechanics says there is a limit. There's a limit to the combined accuracy of how well we can measure the position and momentum of a particle. So it's saying that no matter how accurate your speedometer is and your ruler, you have a hard limit on how well uh, you can actually know the particle's momentum and position at the same time. This was established by a Austrian physicist called Werner Heisenberg in 1927, which at this point was perhaps called the uncertainty principle and has now been called, it now is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. What it states is as follows. Once you take a measurement of a particle's position with some uncertainty delta x, and you also measure the particle's momentum with also some uncertainty delta p. The product of the two uncertainties can never be smaller than h bar over two. 
little typo there. This, sh this should say uh, P for momentum. So this statement means that the the product of the you know your accuracy in position, accuracy in momentum has a lower limit, and that's h bar over two. H bar is just Planck's constant h divided by two pi. It's just kind of h over two pi condensed into a single symbol. And the misconception that arises is that people think that the reason why there's an uncertainty principle is that upon you know opening a box to observe a particle uh, to measure its position or its velocity, that in order to see the particle, there has to be light. So there's you know photons bouncing from the particle to you to your eyes, so you can see the particle or you know your microscope can or whatever. And thus, that requirement for light to be there um, interferes with the particle. And so your observation isn't pure because of the, not, of the light that's necessary to observe and thus creates uncertainty. But that's not the reason why there's this uncertainty limit. This is to do with just the quantum nature of particles. Also, it's worth pointing out that the um, uncertainties are specifically referring to a particular direction. So if you're measuring the horizontal position, then that causes an uncertainty uh, threshold on the horizontal momentum and so on. There's also a formula for the uncertainty in energy and uncertainty on a time interval. So that's delta E times delta T which is the same formula, it's just that delta E, which is uncertainty in an energy measurement times the time interval delta T must be greater than uh, h bar over two. Now, why is there uncertainty in the first place? Well, consider the fact that any, any particle has a wave representation. And suppose that we can take a, momentum measurement of a particle pretty well. So the uncertainty delta p must be small. Um, but then according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that means that the to compensate, the uncertainty in the position must be larger. So the better we know momentum, the less better we can know position. This relates to the uh, wave particle duality because a particle with a you know any given momentum uh, that is related to its wavelength by the, the Broglie wavelength formula. So if you know the momentum exactly, then the particle will actually have to be constructed from a single wave. And as thus, as thus if the particle is represented by a single wave, then there's no localization. There's no particular point where the particle you know, could be in everywhere in space is fair game for the particle since only a single wave is representing it. As thus, the uncertainty in the position is infinitely large because there's nowhere where the position is more favorable or less favorable. Now consider the opposite case. What if we know the position fairly well, then that means that or uncertainty momentum would be, would be worse, would be for the worse. The better we know the position, the less we know its momentum. Um, the reason that is is because for the quantum particle to be well localized, first to know it, where it's located well enough, its wave representation, the wave packet, must be localized. And for that to happen, it needs to be made up of a lot of waves overlapping each other. The more waves that construct the wave packet, the more localized it becomes. But all these waves have different wavelengths. so. As we keep adding more waves to create a more localized particle, we are adding more wavelengths. And as such, the momentum of the wave packet is this like big range of momentum that every com component has, because every component has a wavelength and that's momentum. So when you pile them all together, um, there's no single wavelength and thus there's no single uh, momentum. Thus, you won't be able to like accurately calculate the momentum from the Broglie formula, but at least you will have a more localized wave. The extreme of this is if you um, add you know an infinite amount of waves together, so that the wave packet essentially becomes just like squished in the middle, 
it's exactly located at x is equal to zero. But at this point, you have just so many different waves that the momentum is just impossible to determine. And here's the other form I was talking about. So because the frequency of a quantum particle is related to its energy, then you can rederive the uncertainty relationship for uncertainty and energy and some time interval. And that means is that when you measure energy um, of a particle or anything over some time, there's always some uncertainty in the energy. And that can actually lead to you seemingly getting measurements by your late conservation of energy, but not really, it's simply uh, the uncertainty relation. And of course, because the product of the two is a, you know, has a lower limit, that means that if you increase the time interval over which you measure an energy, that um, improves your accuracy of your energy measurement. So in this quick quiz, we have the particle's uh, location being measured at the origin and there's zero uncertainty. And the question is, how does that affect the velocity component in the y direction? So this could have an effect on the uh, horizontal component of velocity because um, good accuracy in the x position means bad momentum accuracy in the x position only. So that relates to, to velocity, of course. But this is talking about velocity in the y direction, so it will have no effect. So again, when you when you have uncertainty in a particular direction, that affects uncertainties in the same direction as well. And then here's a question just showing you how to get the uncertainty um, of an electron's position based on the uncertainty in the speed. So even though the formula talks about uncertainty in position and momentum, momentum is related to speed. So you just plug in the formula for for uh, momentum, but rather than having you know just regular speed, now you're looking at the formula for uncertainty in momentum, which is the same, but now has uncertainty in speed. And then in this question, um, this is talking about the uh, uncertainty in measuring the frequency of a transitioning atom. And again, even though the formula has an uncertainty in energy, it relates to frequency due to the E equals HF formula. And then here they're asking about the uh, lifetime of the particles and asking which of the two has a smaller uh, fractional uh, difference in the uncertainty frequency. And in this case, the one that has the smallest one would be the <clears throat> radio wave since it has a smaller frequency. Sorry, it's the other way around. Uh, the biggest fractional change would be for the <clears throat> radio wave here at the bottom because it has a smaller frequency. A light wave has, has more. So the fractional change isn't as much. Anyways, that's all for this chapter. I hope to see you next time.